Hi, welcome to the environmental communication part of the environmental policy course. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, lecture to you online, although I must admit that I'd much rather see you face to face and have some kind of quality interaction. Um, what I will be doing in, in, in the coming uh, two days that I will be lecturing and hopefully getting some questions from you via the uh, virtual classroom in Brightspace is to um, briefly introduce you to this field of environmental communication, education and capacity building. Um, my name is Arjen Walls. Before I continue, I work for the Education and Learning Sciences Group, um, which is in the Social Sciences of Wageningen University uh, on the top floor. And um, my field is environmental and sustainability, education and communication and participation as well. And I hope that I will be able to uh, uh, get you uh, enthusiastic about this field, uh, but also um, hope to teach you something about the basic principles of environmental communication. I will um, present uh, in two sessions, and each session is cut up in four units of about 15 minutes. Um, in this first unit, I will give a short introduction, but in the units thereafter, yeah, I will talk a bit about the history of environmental communication from nature conservation education to all the way to sustainability communication and education and um, the different strategies that are being used in environmental communication, as well as um, particular um, approaches that can be used for um, environmental campaigns or for supporting other environmental tools, um, because communication is also needed to explain the other environmental policy tools as well. Um, in the second session, I will zoom in on one model provided by the Council for the Living Environment. And in that model, um, uh, you also uh, kind of dissect human behavior a little bit and come to understand the different components uh, like knowledge, understanding, awareness, attitudes, social norms, um, people's capacity to make change, all has something to do with their ability to live um, in a more environmentally sound way. Two sources will be used. One is the, the model provided by the Council for the Living Environment. Um, when you download the PowerPoint from Brightspace and you click on that uh, purple uh, figure there, you will get to that model um, and a, a paper that I co-authored on, on the differences between environment, between what I call instrumental approaches uh, to environmental communication and more emancipatory approaches. Both these documents are important for, uh, for the exam and I think they're quite straightforward and uh, accessible. Let me start just positioning environmental communication um, as one of the social instruments uh, that can be used and that are part of a whole basket of environmental policy tools that you're already getting and becoming familiar with in this course. Environmental legislation, um, uh, environmental law is one of those areas, but also environmental economics, um, uh, where subsidies and, 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 and uh, monetary incentives can influence behavior. Um, as well as fines and deterrence. Um, and then uh, what we're talking about here is, is communication, education, learning, capacity building um, as, as one of the three essential parts of environmental policy. Um, let me just start out with a few questions that illustrate that um, communicating about environment and sustainability is, is not always uh, as straightforward as you might think. 
uh, questions like are uh, biofuels sustainable, are solar panels sustainable, are vegetables grown in cities, are they healthy? Um, or right now we're facing a, a pandemic, um, is group immunization uh, the best or the most effective way in, in dealing with pandemics and fighting the spread of the coronavirus and preventing uh, too many people becoming sick at the same time? These are rather ill-defined Ill uh, um, um, uh, questions, uh, or at least they, they don't have clear answers. Um, and it's not always easy to communicate uh, these topics because they're ambiguous and um, it might be better uh, that we, instead of asking are biofuels sustainable, we should ask when are they sustainable? Under what circumstances might they be sustainable or at least more sustainable than others? Uh, similarly for energy saving light bulbs, when are they more sustainable than the conventional ones? It depends on many factors. It depends on where you are. In Burundi, you might have a different answer from in Wageningen. It also depends on the on the provisions and the structures that are there, for instance, to recycle and reuse or, or remine the, the metals out of these, these uh, light bulbs. And the toxicity will differ. The old ones may have less toxins than the new ones, but if you have a good system for collecting them, that toxicity may not be a problem. But if you don't, if you don't have that, it will be a problem. So, and this is true for all these questions. It depends a lot on, on where you ask the question, in what context you are, uh, but also what point of time at what point in time you ask the question, what we might think is sustainable today may turn out to be not so sustainable to, tomorrow as we learn new things, as we have new knowledge and as we have experiences uh, and reflect on those experiences and we, we, we realize that we need to recalibrate uh, our, our earlier uh, understandings and, and rethink our technologies. Um, so it, in some ways, um, communicating about and for uh, sustainability uh, is, is an iterative, uh, ongoing process. Um, but we also um, live in a, an age where uh, we have access to lots of information. Um, pe people can Google a lot of these answers, but then the question is, you know, who do you trust? Who put the information there? Um, with what kind of an agenda? Uh, is it based on science? Uh, how, how rigorous was that science? Um, and sometimes uh, doubt is created uh, by forces in society that, that have an interest in creating doubt because as, as long as when people are not sure about whether they should change or not convinced that their lifestyles that they're really accustomed to uh, need to be uprooted and changed, then they, they will use that doubt to, to say, well, as long as it's not clear or as long as scientific evidence is not 100% sure, then I will not change my, my life. But let me know when it is and then I will. But that's the problem with many of these questions. We'll never, work, we'll never know entirely for sure. And, and when that is an excuse not to change our lifestyles, then uh, we, are, we are in trouble, you might say. So we must deal with uncertainty, uh, ambiguity, um, and we also must be critical of, of uh, doubt that is cultivated intentionally by those who are trying to maintain the status quo for their own maybe selfish reasons or their short-term profit reasons or, um, uh, or, or other goals and objectives than living more sustainably on the earth. And people will use um, um, these, these doubts and, and other arguments for not changing their behavior. Um, Andy Singer's cartoon kind of uh, shows that here. You know, the different stages people might go through in, in, in responding to cl climate urgency and, and rising sea, sea levels, for instance, from, from first arguing that humans are not the cause of, of the climate change and uh, uh, it's a natural phenomenon, so I'm not going to change my lifestyle to um, um, a response of, well, it's already gone pretty far and, and, and there's no point in trying to change the, 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 the root causes. We might as well adapt to what's happening and uh, that doesn't require a change in my lifestyle, just to show, you know, an adaptation 
to what is happening, uh, but not really a shift in my values or what I believe in. Um, and then there are those who really believe in technology and, and uh, innovation and, and will say, well, eventually they, they will come up with something. And until that time, I don't see any need to change. Uh, and then maybe at the very end, people might, when, when it's almost too late or when it's too late, perhaps, I might say, okay, okay, I will, I will change my lifestyle. I will rethink uh, the way I live and I will uh, um, um, re revisit or reflect on my values and change them. Of course, we do know a lot. It's not like we are completely in the dark. Uh, there's lots of research and evidence that shows, for instance, that we are in, the, in an era of uh, mass extinction um, and that we are um, facing climate change. This because there's a huge consensus, uh, whether it's the IP, IBES report on biodiversity or the IPCC reports, and all the documented uh, consequences and impacts are quite solid and people are beginning to understand uh, the magnitude of these, these issues, which can also lead to a uh, being overwhelmed and a feeling of powerlessness and, and maybe even climate fear or, or anxiety about the future, which is also something we need to take into consideration when we communicate about these topics. The, the, the emotional, psychological uh, impact of, of these issues and how that might paralyze people's uh, uh, possibility to change. Kate Raworth, uh, the economist from the United Kingdom, she talks about um, the donut economy as a way, to, as a metaphor to show that we need to learn to live within ecological boundaries, within uh, the, the ecological ceiling so as to preserve the integrity of ecosystems and life support systems. We should not disrupt and violate those. Um, at the same time, we need to have a solid social foundation that uh, includes good health, uh, quality education, having a voice, democracy, um, uh, people um, having housing, jobs. So that she calls the social foundation. So we need to find that space uh, that she calls a safe and just space for humanity in which we can regenerate uh, as much as we maybe use and have a more distributive and a more circular economy to support a more balanced lifestyle. And that is the task of environmental policy uh, and, and also of, within that of environmental communication, education and cap uh, capacity building, developing the competencies, the skills, the literacy, the knowledge that people need to be able to live in the donut. To wrap this up, um, um, environmental and sustainability issues can be complicated, ambiguous, sometimes manipulated and framed in a certain way. We need to be critical of that. We need to develop that literacy to, to understand these issues. Um, it makes it challenging to communicate it also because there's a gap between people's maybe values and what they believe in and think and what they actually do. The gap between thinking and doing. We'll talk about that later on in, in one of the units. Uh, but there is some understanding, some universal understandings and knowledge about what is not good and what is unhealthy and unsustainable about which there's little scientific doubt. Um, and there are certain values that, of which we can agree that they are more caring, more nurturing, uh, have to uh, kind of amplify solidarity and sense of community that are more sustainable than some other values that, that plea for more individualism, taking care of yourself and so on. And finally, communication, participation and capacity building are essential components of an all-round strategy to develop a more sustainable society. If you have questions about this, Go to the virtual classroom uh, or send me an email and I will try to get back to you as soon as possible.